Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. Please also consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to our next topic. Well, is the sound okay, or do you want me to use some headphones? Um, if you have headphones, that might be a little better, just because then it'll be closer to the mic more than likely. But with that said, your sound is sounds pretty good right now, too. Okay, let me see if I can get some. Uh, uh... Ah, it's one of these iPhone adapter thingies. <laughs> Yeah, it seems to get more and more tricky the more updates we get with those things. <laughs> oh, I'm way too old for this technology, Mark. <laughs> or, or at least more things to buy. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah. I must have some here. They're all the wrong connectors. I thought I had that organized. What a plonker. Um, I haven't got any, guys. That's all right. No That's worries. You, you we, sound all we, right. A lot of times yeah, it, it's more about kind of like the room and then how close you are to the microphone so if your microphone's like on the computer and you're sitting close enough to it it's probably not a big deal okay cool it's come out okay on on interviews before but i thought i thought the kids were going to be in so i got the headphones ready but the missus has taken them out so that's great so we're not gonna <laughs> chaotic interruptions you know yeah I'm, I'm i'm hearing you pretty good i mean i think it sounds pretty solid i guess yeah. as long as you don't drift back and forth i mean we have some sometimes we have guests that kind of move in and out i think when they get excited and we lose some of their audio which is yeah I've tough to that, control for uh, I'll, I'll sit still <laughs> zach you want to start recording let's just start yep. BSing it. we're good to go so we're going to yep. do a uh we're going to do a q a after this one so it'll be fun so you know i, I noticed that this is one thing we we're talking about the technology have you guys noticed that those damn little iphone chargers i mean i I think they're built in only last about six months, so then you get mm -hmm. roped into buying another one. Is that is that is that just me, or do they seem like they always freaking break? Isn't, isn't that everything nowadays? I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, you get something they know they can make it last longer, but they, they yeah. hit you up for another twenty bucks for a damn new car, cord or something every every few yeah. months. It's crazy. Well, and I notice like I notice sometimes mine like half break, so like they get little like like uh you know a little frayed at the edge and then the phone charges way slower because it's not getting all of the power through it and then it's just frustrating because you wait twice as long for your phone to charge up <laughs> you know yeah. i think i do think there's i mean and it's, speaking of conspiracies you know we love all our conspiracy theories here but you know like it was like years ago when they came out with these razors that were like you know four or five blades and man you could shave like for like six months in a row in one razor and it would never get dull and they really worked and then somebody caught on to that and I was like damn these people aren't buying enough razors we better make shitty razors to get dull quicker i swear to god that's what happened i don't know Did anybody else notice that i mean it yeah, was just yeah. cars cars too man. cars they just break all the time they're designed in and have you uh, noticed when you take them into the garage then it the, things break immediately afterwards i think they have some sort of auto function for making everything break you know yeah this, this is what's is, happening this is an overlying theme, and I think you know we can we can roll this into nutrition. How they're feeding us to make us break and require more money to to fix <laughs> ourselves. You know. <laughs> so Phil, hey man, you know because I remember you messaged me. I can't remember where it was a while about a year, year and a half ago, something like that. And you start talking about this crazy carnivore and asking me about that stuff, and we kind of went back and forth. And it looks like you know you adapted it, and so you've got a great story to tell. And you know you started a Facebook group. I think it's called 100% Carnivore and Beyond. And I want to get into the carnivore stuff. I want to get into your story because I think it's pretty interesting, a little bit of your background. But I also want to get into the in the and beyond stuff because that stuff is kind of interesting. We could talk a little bit what what the and beyond means, and you know maybe get into some of the some of the other crazy stuff you guys are up to over there. But let's 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 just get a little bit of your story, little Phil, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. It's 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 been really strange becoming this meat guy because <laughs> I've got this sort of background in spirituality and music and. Uh, all that kind of thing. And so now, now to suddenly become like that is, is, is weird with the YouTube channel. It seems to be this sort of new thing. And whatever I, whatever I post and blog about, there's somebody underneath arguing about meat, you know, or sending me death threats like yours. Oh, you yeah, did that's fun. It's, 
when you, know, when you yeah. put stuff up about about um, the best death threat gets a prize, you know, I think that's hilarious. But yeah, yeah we all get that. Yeah, so so yeah, it's been it's been funny. I've been in 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 a sort of yogi community for a while. I was born in '62 in in England and um, ended up up here up north in in this sort of TM transcendental meditation community, which I don't really have anything to do with anymore and haven't for the last ten years, but. It uh, it kind of brainwashed me into the vegetarian thing. So I was vegetarian for a long time until I bought a gym and I ran a gym in, in 97. I, I wrote my first book on diet and Ayurveda and stuff like that in about 96. And I just I just re-released that and I had to change the diet section. That was a load of rubbish. The rest of it was good. But uh, yeah, and I, I, I started eating meat again in the gym when I was training hard and um, my body was crying out for it, but it was still mixed in with the carbs and I knew how to get people big, but I never knew how to get anybody lean, you know, and either they did or they didn't, depending on their sort of, uh, you know, their insulin sensitivity, I guess. And, uh, and then for the, after I sold the gym in 2001, I, I kind of remained predominantly veggie, but I, uh, I I went to the sort of pizza and pasta end of vegetarianism, you know, and got pretty fat and sick over the next 10 years. And then in 2010, I came back from a holiday in Thailand and I, I'd had a few warning signs over the years, but I came back from this holiday and um, suddenly one ankle blew up and then and that was my right ankle. And then the left ankle blew up about a, a week later. And then my knee and my wrist kicked in again that I realized had been also probably ticking over since the early 90s. And my back had been bad for ages. And, and then just I got so sick. And eventually they diagnosed it as psoriatic arthritis, sort of early 2011. And with my vegetarian brainwashing, I decided the best thing to do would be to come become extra vegetarian and go vegan. And then I went kind of raw vegan and ended up at five foot ten, I ended up at about 125 pounds, really emaciated, and um, I'd lost all my muscle. And I, I suppose I was about 10 pound heavier than that um, after the vegan thing. But then I, I went keto and discovered all the cold thermogenesis and stripped the last of the fat off. But honestly, I I, I looked kind of like Dr. Gregor, you know. After that, it was it was pretty pretty uh, extreme. And so it took me a long time wading through, just studying hours and hours and hours a day and trying every single goji man protocol and all that sort of thing. And it never worked. And eventually it, with keto and with um, introducing all of Jack Cruz's type of um, principles, I discovered his site. And, uh, and, and a lot of that was incredibly useful once I could decipher it. And... Um, ended up get bringing the inflammation down. And then in about uh, the winter of 2013, I think, I managed to train again. And it was, it was amazing, really, because I, uh, I managed to put on about two stone, you know, about 30 pounds of muscle and some fat, too, because I'd reintroduced a few carbs over one winter. And um, it, it was just training really abbreviated, like about 10 minutes a week, like, you know, the sort of Doug McGuff type of thing. And... Um, since then, I, I kind of didn't train after that, and I, I've been a lazy dude, and it's been absolutely amazing going carnivore because it it maintains it. The inflammation came down even more in the last uh, you know couple of years. I wouldn't even say it was it was it wasn't joint inflammation that had pretty much gone, apart from a few twinges in my left knee that I told you about a while ago. But um, you know, it's it, it became possible to just get on with life get on with my drumming again and get on with everything and just forget about it and so yeah this it was a huge step like it was from you it, and a, for you it was a surprise coming down from coming from keto and just giving up those last few veg and then doing all the research and trying to understand why that had happened exactly and you know putting all these principles into place including the beyond stuff that you were mentioning it, it it's it's been really miraculous, and I, I think you know I'm 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 kind of ready to start training again. It's about time to do that. That'll be interesting to see what happens there on full carnival, because it keeps you in such good health and and such good shape. You know, I stay I stay lean while I'm stuffing my face, and at 56 that's not bad. I think I'm the only sort of 56 year old guy around here I know without a belly, 
and, and I, I, I don't I don't pound the streets and I don't do anything like that. So it's it's been a fascinating journey, and and it's so much you know the simplicity of carnivore I think is beautiful. So yeah, that, that's where we are now, really. And and yeah, that Facebook group you were you were saying, I started it for about ten friends, and I think there's like I don't know four and a half thousand people in there now. And it's fun, you know. It's a kind of a naughty, irreverent group, and it's it's kind of amusing, and uh, and yeah. So that's that's kind of enjoyable. And the YouTube channel seems to have gone nuts, and I get a you know probably not as many threats as you, but <laughs> enough to keep me going. You know? So yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, I mean it's 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 good to see the story. You know, I think this is something, and you kind of glossed over this a little bit. Psoriatic arthritis is destructive. I mean, it's a horrible, horrible. A condition to have. I mean, it's it's literally debilitating. It's life changing in a negative way. And and to, you know, having treated literally thousands of arthritis patients over a career, um, <clears throat> you know, arthritis usually just doesn't get better. I mean, it really doesn't. I mean, you can mitigate it, you can manage it, you know, but it generally is a relentless process, particularly these inflammatory arthropathies. You know, we've got all kinds of um immunosuppressant drugs immunomodulating drugs you know corticosteroid you know corticosteroid prednisone things like that um and you know it just doesn't get better and i think it's so fascinating seeing uh rheumatoid arthritis psoriatic arthritis even regular arthritis really kind of going away and i think that's that's revolutionary in my mind so i think it's uh the more people that hear about this and try it i think the 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 more information we're going to get i think it's you know what's causing it you know, it's hard to say right now. Certainly, there does seem to be at least some component of diet. I mean, and whether, uh, you know, I don't know if you listened to the episode we had with Sabato or Chabotothon a while back, uh, uh, you know, and we're talking about the things that tend to disrupt gut permeability and uh, or and cause increased gut permeability. And, you know, the seed oils being the biggest culprits followed by some of the medications and then various different, you know, various different plant foods, you know, including dairy. Dairy was in there, too. So I can't say it's all all good in the, in the animal world, but I mean, certainly dairy seemed to have an impact. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, it is fascinating, you know, when you get in social media and you, you know, you, believe me, it's a very polarizing uh, stance we're taking here. And there are people that are willing to go to any length whatsoever to, you know, sort of oppose what you, what you want to say. And all, you know, all you and I are doing, Phil, is just telling people, Hey, this works for a lot of people's help. Why don't you try it? Um, and, uh, you know, and and you start out doing that, and all of a sudden you're you're the devil, you're Hitler. You know, your soul <laughs> deserves to roast in hell. You know, and then you go back and you punch back a little bit once in a while, and all of a sudden you're being mean. And I have Dr. Joel Kahn telling me, "Oh, you're a mean guy because you had the audacity to question veganism." You know, and I'm like, "Well, look, you're out there, you know, preying on 14 year old girls and telling them that uh, you know, live kind, don't eat this little pig." And now they're going to get a nutrient deficiency or some malnutrition problem. And then you're going to sell them supplements on top of that. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, what, what puzzles me is, is how, many, how many vegans have come to me, even ones who've argued with me for, for years. And they've sort of, they'll, they'll, they'll send me a message one day going, oh, my thyroid's blown up or something. Or I've got this terrible digestion. And, and I get them again and again, even after I did a Buddha at the gas pump interview, which is a sort of spiritually type channel. It's a wonderful channel. I was kind of really honored to get on that. And after that, I kind of mentioned it. And, and a few people got in touch with me, even some um, some kind of spiritual teachers who felt they'd sort of lost their awakenings, if you like, after 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 this. And take one look at them and say, hey, what are you eating? And what are you eating? And it's it's all the grains and pulses. And they sometimes get a bit you know, outraged that you might suggest it could be something to do with eating an Indian diet, you know, in the Northern Hemisphere. And um, and I've even had somebody come to me recently, a really cool guy, and I, I can't say who he is at the moment, but somebody kind of high up in the vegan world who who, who has contacted me, who's who's going to make a big impact, I think, when this comes out about, about him coming over to carnivory. And I, it fascinates me that with all this evidence, the hundreds and hundreds of... Um, uh, uh, of videos now on YouTube of people breaking on the vegan diet and and the huge evidence that you're putting out and everybody's putting out about how it really isn't um, such a compassionate thing, you know, and and yet still there's this enormous militancy. It, it, it really is a religion. It's it's I didn't realize, you know, when I started that group, I put something up in the in the pin post saying, to, you know, hold back on the vegan bashing. But 
now I kind of let it go because it, I think it's I think it's it's important to really drill this in. Some people just say, oh well, you know, if everybody wants to eat like that, and absolutely, you know, I don't do everything optimally, but at least I know. I think my message and yours is not to tell the whole world to do it, but just to say, hey, it's there, and it's a really good healing modality, and you should try it if you if you've got some kind of chronic disease. It's well worth a try. I mean, look at my mum, my. My mom at 93, she died earlier this year because she had a couple of bouts of pneumonia. But last year, or was it the year before, I can't remember, but we, we reversed her breast cancer on this. And I've got a little talk up on YouTube about that with pictures. She was kind enough to let me use the pictures. And, and the breast cancer just reversed. I mean, and basically, I'd say that was a carnivore diet and a five quid bottle of iodine. And, and it, it, it amazed me how it just completely vanished, this horrible tumor that was, that was coming through the skin, you know, it was, it, it, and it just reversed. The skin went back to normal and everything. Whether the actual whole of the lump would have disappeared, I don't know. But it's not about getting the lump rid of the lump, is it? It's about, it's about reversing the process of, of, of what's going on. The lumps are just really your, your, um, your, your instrument panel to see what's going on. I, I think that... Um, Ivor Cummins was mentioning about the the, the religion of cancer uh, on your podcast and, and how you just can't touch it, you can't talk about it. And if you suggest that there might be another way around, apart from these devastating chemo drugs, um, you get horrendously shouted down. And I, I tend to sort of steer clear of it, although I've seen amazing results. You know, Andrew Scarborough, who, who, who uh, has done quite a few interviews, who's on, uh, who's on my group and he's on your group, and his, his brain cancer and whatever, uh, it's amazing the stories out there. And I mean, he's hardcore, isn't he? He's eating grubs and worms and, uh, and uh, you know, organ meats and everything all at once, brains and mealworms. Yeah, he's a character, Andrew. But yeah, it's, it's, there's so much evidence out there. It's amazing that there's such a backlash about it. Crazy, crazy religion. Well, we broke that rule when we had... Uh... Uh, Professor Thomas Seyfried on the show, we we definitely <laughs> went into the cancer stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah no, I, 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 what you say makes makes a lot of sense. And the other thing I always kind of find interesting is like, to me with diet and nutrition, um, like my big kind of like more or less holistic view is like, ask yourself, are you happy? Are you healthy? And are you enjoying life? Because um, I very much think nutrition is like a huge, huge variable when it comes to those things. And if the answer is yes, then you're you're probably doing something right, at least at the moment. Um, but if the answer is no, it's probably worth exploring. So then when you have some of these movements um, that kind of turn from here are our benefits, these are what these can be used for, to let's see what else we can try to convince people that this is going to do that is either just plain wrong or false or kind of in the gray areas where you kind of get, get it gets weird and I think you see that I think you know veganism is one of the one of the biggest ones out there right now with that potential because you know they looked at what what benefits people have had from a vegan approach um, and you can make the argument of like well coming from a really really poor diet you know a vegan diet is probably better sort of thing to like this religious fervor where now it's like okay I don't feel good this is no longer working for me, but I have to stick with it because all my friends are vegan or, you know, um, I've been doing this for so long or it's the right thing to do, so to speak. And then it becomes this motivation to stay the course despite not being healthy, despite not being happy and despite not enjoying life any longer. And that's where I think it gets really tricky and where it gets hard to kind of simplify nutrition, um, which I think is hopefully the goal for most people, like simplify it so that you can make it sustainable and, you know, stay with it it's like you know the one i always like is the diet after the diet so like if you're if your diet is something that you're gonna have to drastically change somewhere down the road then i think a either hopefully you're doing that because you're in such dire straits that you need to kind of reset then you know get something that's more or less sustainable which i think you probably see like more in like the real chronic obesity world um and then like, but like, I think, I think the, the question people should ask is, well, can I do this long term? Um, and that, I think that's a, a good question to ask. <laughs> and, I, and I think with the, with the carnivore movement, I think the, <clears throat> the, the cool thing about that is it gained momentum. And I've said this in other podcasts too, it kind of gained momentum uh, after there was like a little bit of a paper trail. Like you get Charles Washington's zeroing in on health group where 
you know, I think they're up to like almost 30,000 people there and some folks almost 20 years on. So it's not necessarily a, a question to me, like, is, is this something that people can stick to? There certainly are people who have found it something they can stick to. Um, and so I think those are all just like, you know, kind of interesting thoughts and, and ways to kind of go about this whole nutrition stuff. Yeah, I've, f- I've found it incredibly easy to stick to. I've found it much easier to stick to than a keto diet mm-hmm. where you're constantly working out grams and things like that. You know, I- I'm really lazy and I don't have a scientific or a mathematical brain. And so trying to work all that out is, is, very, is very difficult. But what I'm seeing is such beautiful results of people coming straight onto this. There's all these things, you know, all these things that I had to learn about all this detox thing and all these things you have to unlearn that are probably nonsense, really. Oh, you know, do this detox and that one and juice this and then in, reintroduce that. And then re- can it really be that simple? This is what puts people off, I think, that it just seems to be so incredibly simple. So I had to just sit there, you know, a couple of years ago and, and say, I'm just going to throw out all of this knowledge. Uh, OK, so I've studied diet for like 30 years. I've gone crazy at it. And I understand all, when 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 vegetable police decided to go carnivore and go uh, goji man made that video, you know, you should do this and do this protocol and do that one. And I had to listen through it. And I thought, you know, I've tried all those and I'm just so glad it's behind me. It's it's. It's crazy. This is this way of doing it seems to be so simple. Is it for everybody? I'm I'm kind of interested in the way Jack Cruz looks at it. That uh, you know, looking at it through the lens of, of light and deuterium. And is it that um, that all these chronic diseases could have some kind of a root in in deuterium in the cell, and the cell not being allowed to um, turn itself over? You know, there's no autophagy, apoptosis. This isn't happening. And and so cancers grow, and as they drink deuterium depleted water and get um, get uh, uh, their diet low in deuterium, you know, get all the carbs out and all the plant matter out, then these things tend to resolve, and cancer mops up. I don't know if you saw um, Dr. Laszlo Boris's talk at Vermont 2018, but it was wonderful. He's one of the leading researchers in um, into deuterium, but it was a wonderful talk, and, and also just, it's, I, think, I think it's an hour 12, but exactly on an hour, on the last 12 minutes, he goes into this lovely story about um, his, his brother, who he's had a twin brother who was also a doctor, who got cancer, and he went for the chemo and died, and, and just after uh, his funeral, uh, Laszlo Boris went, went and uh, got checked, and he found he had cancer too. And he'd been researching into this deuterium thing. And he said, well, I'm just going to take it into my own hands. I'm having nothing to do with chemo. And all, all of his relatives, of course, you know, they, they said, well, this, you know, you should go for it and whatever. Uh, I think like a lot of relatives do. And, um, and he got rid of his. And he's around today and he's fine and he's talking about it. And I, I, think, I think Jack's got quite a point here. And, you know, all the, all the influences that might deplete deuterium, like um, sunlight, getting enough sun exposure and that kind of thing. And so, to me, it's it, it's it's looking at it as as what would nature do? You know, up here in the north of England, you're not going to be eating a banana in the winter, and so it's not a health food. This is this is why the the paleo movement seems a, 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 to have missed the point a little bit, where they're going, is some food paleo or isn't it? Well, where do you live? You know, if you're totally healthy and you've got your feet on the ground and you've got lots of sun exposure and everything else is right and you're happy, you're not stressed out, you've got a great family life and you pick a banana off a tree and eat it, it's not going to do any harm at all probably. But if you're insulin resistant and, and you're in a high rise block of flats in the, in, in the north of England and you eat it in the winter, then this is going to do you some harm. And I think this is the thing that, that to, to show people that it's very possible that meat is our reset food. You know, you, you, you eat a steak and, and, and some corn and then, and then you, you tell me, vegetarian, which one comes out the other end. You know, which, which one is identifiable? So, you know, what's, what is digestible? Because they go crazy when you say meat is the most easy, easily digestible food. And so if it's that easy on the gut and it's helping the gut to heal up and everything, well, this is obviously a huge part of, of, of all these uh, chronic diseases. Is it the first in line of the chain or is it the light unbalancing all of our circadian biology or is it the deuterium building up in the cell? What is it? You know, is it chicken and egg? What's happening first? But I think, you know, whichever part of that wheel of health or wheel of ill health you attack it on, you, one thing leads to another and it, it, it all creates a, a wonderful um, whole package of health if you get it all together. That's why I put beyond in the group, really, because... Although a lot of people will heal from a carnivore diet or a, or a keto diet, 
there are a lot of people like me who who need to implement all the other stuff too. I think I was, you know, I, I, I think I was just more of an idiot than most people. I've always had a great idea about pretty much how to keep myself healthy, at least moderately healthy, but I didn't because I've got this sort of self-destructive tendency and I've had times where I've gone nuts. And, and so I think my, my psoriatic arthritis was perhaps more deep rooted than most. I see people just go carnivore and it clears up. And some people it doesn't, you know, maybe you have to look at the light and you have to look at your EMFs and you have to look at emotional balancing and all the woo woo stuff as well. You know, anything can really come into this. Having spent all that time in the TM movement and whatever, I, I, I've sort of seen a lot of this woo woo stuff implemented and that's kind of the only side they've got. And now all these guys up here, my old friends, are dying of cancer and they're all vegetarian and it's, it's, it's very sad, but they won't change from their, their diets. And that's probably what's wrong, along with a few other things. They've got a few woo-woo things in place, but they're not enough on their own. You have to look at the whole picture. It's a huge picture health, I think. Phil, I, you know, I'll, I'll claim agnosticism on, on deuterium. I, I haven't really researched it. I know Jack Cruz has been talking about that. Maybe we should get Jack on the show at some point to kind of get into this and flesh this out a little more. But... Um, you know, you because you, you know, obviously you've got a diet, you've got some other things, you've got, you know, five or six other interventions you're doing. And in your experience and the experience of people that you've maybe seen that are, that are doing these things, would it be possible to say which one contributes what percentage wise to, to overall health in your view? Because in my view, I think diet is, is very highly up. I think it's probably the primary driver. And I think these other things can be supplemented. Um, but have, can you, can, is there a sense of saying, well, how much of this emotional balancing gives me 5% diet gives me diet gives me 50% or, you know, exercise gives me 10%. Have you been able to kind of figure out relative contributions? I mean, obviously there's a whole package and obviously not everyone can do all of these things. I mean, there's practical considerations. We all can't run around drinking deuterium depleted water and, oh, yeah. and you know, doing this stuff. I mean, it's, it's some of it's just, it's just. It's financially impractical for some people. It's, you know, lifestyle impractical for other people. So if you had to say, you know, these are my top five things and this is how much significance I would give them, could you could you could you hope to guess on that right now? Yeah, that's a cool question. And it kind of varies depending on who it is. I think, you know, drinking deuterium and depleted water is probably not necessary at all when you're on a carnivore diet and you haven't got pancreatic cancer or something. You know, if I did, I'd definitely introduce that. I think it entirely depends on the person. I'd have to agree with you. I mean, Jack's always shouting at me and posting on uh, on the carnival group, why don't you stop being a diet guru? The world needs more light gurus. You know, Jack's so hot on that. Uh, but to me, I, I'm going to have to agree with you that I think the biggest factor in most people's health, you know, of bringing down the symptoms immediately, is it the root cause? I couldn't say. But to bring the symptoms down immediately is diet. When you get somebody on a carnivore diet, the results are so spectacular for a wide range of, of issues. And also, it's the thing that people have in their mind the most. If you lead them into that and you get them 80, 90 percent better, perhaps the other bits can come into play. Maybe the other bits were the things that caused it. I don't know. You know, but but I don't I think diet is a huge one for bringing it down. If your diet's wrong, once all these things have gone wrong, you see, if you get somebody who is, um, say somebody's incredibly uh, uh, depressed or they've got schizophrenia or something like that, something I have experience of after, after a, a, a huge bout of um, psilocybin experimentation in, in 1979, and that, you know, that hit me for a couple of years, <clears throat> and I know what it feels like, and that's all you're thinking about, and it ne I never twigged to, for, to me that my diet had changed, but I should think that's... Um, correlated with it just as much as the hallucinogenics. But I think that um, if some, you see, everybody has a different factor. Somebody might be, have a really good diet, but then they might be incredibly stressed and have uh, all sorts of hang-ups and false beliefs and, and they're all in a bit of a tangle mentally. And even that will be brought down by the diet to a level where it's bearable and they can look at it. I'll tell you a weird story though. Um, this is something that was very strange. But my mum, you know, who, who, who we, we fixed her breast cancer. In, 2000, in 2013, we were all living in a, a, the same house after my dad died 10 years previously. And we all lived in this big house and uh, I, we were looking after her. And, uh, you know, she was difficult, my mum. She really was. And then my, uh, I, I, I started seeing my girlfriend, who I now have kids with, 
around 2006. And she's a saint. She'll put up with anything. But my mom, you know, she, she was kind of difficult. I won't go into any of the particular uh, details. But I was pretty desperate to get out of there. And I remember reading in, in some particular book, this is getting into a bit of the woo-woo stuff, that, um, you know, certain problems, certain emotional balances or, you know, emotional disturbances correspond to certain parts of the body. And what's been fascinating to me with arthritis is it can hit any, any joint. But can any rheumatologist on the planet tell you why it's in your ankles and not in your knee or vice versa or in your right knee or not your, or, or not your left knee? They can't. They, they have absolutely no idea about that. And the only people I've seen who got into that are the people um, like Louise Hay and stuff like that who've, who've written these books about understanding your body. And I mean, so many people have found benefits. Now, finally, it got too much for me. And I said, hey, we can't do this anymore. We're moving into a house and you're moving into uh, a, a, an apartment or whatever nearby. We still looked after her. And two weeks after, I, you know, you try all the sort of emotional freedom technique and Byron Katie stuff and all this kind of woo-woo stuff. And sometimes you can really unwind something. But sometimes, you know, there, there's no excuse or, or, or no, no uh, substitute for, for getting the fuck out of a situation. And we did. And uh, within two weeks of moving in here, in 2013, my ankles, which were always the worst joints, I could barely walk on them. They're really inflamed, really swollen, disfigured. Um, they healed up. Bang. There was no change in diet. There was nothing. And there's this whole kind of emotional thing of the ankles are concerned with not wanting to run away, nor trying not to run away from something that you need to run away from. So that was really fascinating to me because at the time other joints were still affected. I mean, to the point where I really couldn't play drums. My right wrist was in, in, in a terrible state, my left knee, you know, my neck, my back, one of my fingers was like a sausage, all of these sort of things. And none of that calmed down, but the ankles went completely disappeared and never came back so the thing is i hadn't got on full carnival yet i'd only just started getting into keto and that was really calming things down but what happened there i don't know totally unscientific but i've seen these sort of things happen but yes my first my first line of attack always is is carnival and then you can sort of lead people into the subtler things and is it useful for everybody no because some people are probably completely together I mean, I, I, I take you two guys, right? I mean, some people are kind of pretty lost about their life path, but you two guys have got a real good focus on stuff. You've, you've done the most extraordinary things that blow me away. I mean, the, the times that I've, I, I, I've linked your stuff, Zach, to vegans who keep banging on about rich roll, you know, <laughs> so, saying you absolutely need all these carbs. And, you know, this, this, this kind of thing blows me away. You two guys have probably got really good uh, life path. You understand that? But a lot of people are really lost. You know, and anything can do that. Or is it just that that destabilizes the gut as well and, and that the meat helps heal it up? I don't know. I, I, I don't know at all. I can only tell from an individual person. When, when they Skype me and, and I do a consult with somebody, you see, I don't pretend to be a doctor or anything like that, but I, I do have an idea about all the factors that can upset the body and, and, and create ill health. And I'm just sort of putting it back into fooling the body into its ancestral uh, state, you know, thinking that it is in its ancestral state a bit more than living under artificial light and watching telly. That, that can, all of these little things can do it. And some people, it's obvious, they're not eating too bad, but then you talk to them and they say, well, you know, I'm on my computer all night and, and have you got iris on your computer? Have you cut the blue light? Are you wearing some shades? No, I'm not. And then you see that this is disrupting their sleep. And however good your diet is, if you're not sleeping more than an hour or two a night, you know, your body's just not going to work. And so it's, it depends entirely, I think, on, on the individual case and, and, and who is unbalanced in one particular area of their life. You know, say you two guys, probably very, very balanced emotionally, very sure of your life path, having a great time, but diet. So therefore, diet would probably be the main thing. You see what I mean? That's, that's the way I look at it. it. It depends, individual people. Yeah, you know, and I think, you know, when you look at, some of this stuff too like you you have to consider some things and i i know like the big thing now is like oh well it it's a placebo effect you believe it's going to work so it does or you know what else did you change or is it just like a you know a positive due to eliminating like maybe a couple things that were causing problems and you got rid of you know like 90 percent of stuff that would have been just fine in the process and yeah 
and I always think about like, because when I got into kind of a low carb approach you know, back in 2011, part of it was not necessarily like my athletic performance was starting to suffer, but I was like, you know, waking up three to four times a night to go to the bathroom and stuff like that. And um, when I tried the low carb stuff, that was one of the first things that kind of corrected itself was my sleep. I was able to sleep through the night consistently. You know, I went from planning like 10, 11 hours a night so I can make sure I got eight to nine to just if I needed eight to nine hours of sleep, I'd go to bed and then know I was going to get that and wake up right up after that. And, you know, for me, it's like, you can tell me that's a placebo and, you know, all this other stuff, but it's like, you know, at the end of the day, what's, uh, what, what would you want me to do? Go back to a high carb approach and just assume it was a placebo and hope that that works. It's like, it's kind of funny to me with like the different directions these all take. Well, you know, I think I think the placebo effect is a very powerful thing. You, you see, from the carnivore point of view, I have a, a a reputation, you know, in the group as being a bit woo woo. But then, from from the, the the TMers point of view up here, I'm absolutely heretical and I've thrown everything out. But you see, the the thing that fascinates me has always fascinated me in life is is not following one path or another, but dispelling the bullshit in any path. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't say that I, I'm there, but I, I, I'm an awful lot closer than I was 10, 20, 30 years ago. And I've been in that whole spiritual thing for so long. Now, even the mention of the word spiritual kind of annoys me because there's more bullshit in that than there is in the diet field. And so there are some absolute gems in there, things that really work and mm-hmm. wonderful stuff. But most of it is nonsense, you know, and most of the spiritual movements now are, are pretty much a religion anyway. And they say, oh, we're not a religion, we're spiritual and all that. So. And, and some of the things that they get indoctrinated by, by you know, just in the same way as we've been indoctrinated with food pyramids and things, then they have some Indian guy who comes over, who came over in the 60s and started saying, oh, don't eat meat because it's unspiritual. And this is this has probably killed, you know, uh, uh, or almost as many people as, as the whole lipid hypothesis and stuff. So it's it's a it's it's a matter for me of just digging out the crap. Mm-hmm. If I found something tomorrow that was better than carnivory, I'm on it, but I, I, you know, I've been through every single dietary uh, approach. I haven't just come from a sad diet. Or I've just come from bed. I've, I've tried everything, and so I, I can't see where I've got left to go now in diet. And this is, it's the one with the most bullshit built up around it, isn't it? You know, there's there's everybody saying this and saying that, but everybody's devil is the meat is meat. This mm-hmm. is the evil, and it's uncovering that for people that's taking the most time. It's funny, you know, you can. I, I can talk to somebody, I can talk about light, and I can talk about this and that, and grounding, you know, getting your feet on the ground, getting out in nature. And and they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you say, oh, and eat just meat. Oh, you know, don't be so ridiculous. And and then you, you have to spend a month sort of disassembling that that brainwashing and coming up with all of this stuff of why, really, probably every ancestral tribe knew it. It's very based on Ayurveda up here, you know, all the theories of Ayurveda in in um, in in up here in the TM community and among many spiritual communities, they're very, uh, they're very influenced by Ayurveda and, and, and they end up eating all this rice and dal and pulses, lentils, all this sort of thing. But actually, if you look in the real old texts, they're saying there is nothing so nourishing for the body as, 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 as fresh meat and they're, they're uh, equating it to amrit, which is nectar. You know, and this you can find in the old texts of Ayurveda and everyone's ignoring that. But the best vaidyas in India will say, yeah, this is the same. My, my son went out to, um, I have a, a son of 28 as well as my three and nine-year-olds. I, I have a good spread of kids there. And my 28-year-old went out for Panchakarma treatment a couple of years ago in, in uh, Kerala. With Panchakarma being the Ayurvedic treatment of sort of detox and blah, blah, all that sort of thing. And he was there with a true idea, not one of the westernized ones. And, and he said, well, what would you have done with my dad? He sort of cured himself on bone broths and fatty meats and that kind of thing, and they said, oh yeah, yeah, we'd have done that. You know, connective tissue, brains, bone broths, fat, and, and, and he was blown away. And so was I, and this was the first time I started to look into it, and I thought, hey, every culture's probably known this apart from us, and in the last hundred years, we've built up this nonsense around it. If you read that Stephenson book, you know, where, where, where he's living with the Inuit and whatever, and when he's talking to doctors back then, they seem to be much more open. They're going, hey, that's interesting, rather than don't be so ridiculous. You can get your five a day. It, it, it's, the, 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 the brainwashing has built up and up over, over the years. So 
for me in any field, whether it's diet, spirituality, you know, or, or the biohacking community, it's it's trying to weed out what's nonsense and what isn't. That's that's what I enjoy doing, really, not following one particular dogma. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 you're you're very correct in the fact that we've had I don't know fifty, seventy, a hundred years now of a concentrated effort. Some people will say it originated with uh, religion via things like the Seventh Day Adventist Church and how they basically uh, founded the American Dietetics Association through Ellen White in 1917, and the message has been, you know, let's get meat out of the diet, fruits and vegetables are our salvation, you know, and then, of course, we've got the uh, Kellogg's Corporation and the cereal manufacturers, you know, which are very, <laughs> who've you know, significantly influenced the dietary guidelines as well, uh, you know, and so we've got this, this, you know, not even one generation, but probably about three or four generations now where we've been sort of, it's almost been like a intentional brainwashing, I, su I, su I suppose. And then, uh, you know, we've got countless examples of cultures where they didn't do that and they were doing fine. And the problem is people say, well, these people didn't live very long. You know, the, the Inuit, you know, they, they, they lived X amount of years or cavemen, they only lived X amount of years. And, you know, my always, <laughs> it's kind of interesting when, when the Inuit were first, stumbled upon you know by russian explorers back in the i guess probably mid 1800s they found that they were living as long as anyone else you know their 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 life expectancy was just as long and they were you know largely considered free of disease um and you know that, that was about 45 years of age which was about the average world population back then and it takes into account uh you know infant mortality rate and so on and so forth and so we have this uh uh, you know, perception that diet somehow leads to life expectancy when, when really it's, you know, sanitation, access to fresh water, wealth is probably the biggest. If you want to live long, live in a rich country and, and, and make a lot of money, that's probably your best, that's the best dietary advice I can give you as far as, <laughs> you know, longevity. But I mean, we have this, you know, Phil, it's pretty obvious. And here's the thing, because and again, not to not to continue to do this, but, you know, veganism appeals to young people, you know, and because young, healthy kids are young, healthy kids. I mean, people conflate youth with health. And, you know, it's not till you get to 30, 40, 50, 60 years of age, you kind of get really in tune with what health really means, because because when you lose it, you figure out pretty rapidly what that absence of health looks like. You know, when I was 20, I could eat whatever I want. I got drinking, I could do, and, you know, I bounce back and I'm great. I feel great. I, I look good. I, you know, phys I was physically fit, lean, muscular guy. But, you know, as, as time goes on, those things change. I think those are the better people to test this on. Um, you know, some like yourself, when you get some life altering disease, you know, you can tell what's healthy and what's not. And we have this sort of perception okay. that, you know, we are unable to, to assess our own health, which I think is ridiculous. You know, you have to have some doctor poking you with a needle uh, and, you know, you, you're, you're waiting on the mail to come in to say if you're healthy or not. You, you, we don't need to do that. I mean, you can you can you can literally look in the mirror and, and assess your own health probably as good as any physician can. And I, and I know that's heretical. And a lot of people disagree with that, but I, I strongly feel feel that's the case. And, uh, you know, hopefully more people will wake up to sure there's uses for advanced testing. And, you know, if you're sick, we can do that. But I mean, my goodness, most people, most people should never even need to go to the damn doctor. You know, that's, that's how it should be. I mean, we've got this, you have to get your preventive medicine. You have to get your preventive checkup so that we can potentially sell you a drug more, more likely. Um, but really, I mean, you know, I haven't, I mean, I'm a physician, you know, you can argue about, <laughs> that people argue about that all the time, but I've not literally gone to the doctor more than one or two times in my whole life, because I don't need to, and that's how people should live. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, the, the, the side of medicine that I love, people say, oh, are you against medicine and stuff? I mean, the stuff that you were doing out there in Afghanistan or whatever just blows me away when I was hearing about you talking about this stuff with putting human crap in bombs and whatever. I mean, it's it's just unthinkable and the stuff that you dealt with out there. And it's funny, it pisses me off online when people come up and say, hey, he's not a doctor and he's struck off and all this nonsense. I go, have you actually listened to him? Just go listen to what happened and go, go and see what he's done. What have you done? It, it, it's crazy, you know, but I, I, I agree with you. I think I think intuition is the thing. To teach people intuition is, is something I, I like to do more than any particular dietary thing. But just to just to listen to their own bodies, people come and they say, 
do you think I should eat this and this much fat and this much? I say, listen to your body. You know, how's your body feeling? What, what's it doing? And uh, uh, what, what sort of feedback are you getting from it? What little whispers are happening before they become shouts? And, and that, that to me is, is the biggest skill of all. But you have to take away an awful lot of the addictions probably because a lot of people say, well, hey, if I listen to my intuition, what I want is a big bar of chocolate and a tub of haagen -Dazs. And of course it is, but that's not really your intuition, is it? That's, that's, just, that's just the addiction that you built up over the years. But once you've been on a carnivore diet for a while, I, I find the intuition is, is fantastic for diets, keeping it just a diet for the moment, is, um, you know, some days I'll wake up, like this morning, I thought it's a lamb day. It's, I've got to have a leg of lamb. You know, and I've, I've got to have that and I've got to get some bone broth. I've got to put some butter in it, some salt and pepper and tip that on it and have loads of lamb in a kind of bone brothy soup. And some days I think about that and I think, oh, that's revolting. and I can't, I can't handle that. What I need is steak. And, and the, the, the subtler intuitions that you have are probably what's, what's needed. And then some days that, you know, there's, I absolutely have to get some, some prawns or shrimp, as you call them, the big ones in the shells you know, and, and, and fry them up with some butter and, and have them and chew, and chew up the shells as well. And that's all that I could think of. And other days I think, my God, imagine crunching up a prawn. That's no good. And it's, it's those subtler things. And I, it's lovely when you see people heal and they get on. Like you said, you can tell when you're ill. It's like they say about bi bipolar people, isn't it? They're like everybody else, only more so. And I think you can you can feel that with a diet with a, with with a, a, a with diet with illness. If you've got a leaky gut, you can really tell what's 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 what hurts and what doesn't because you don't have that protection anymore. And so all of the things like uh, you know the stuff that Georgia Reed's saying about the plant toxins, this makes so much sense to me. And and Chris Cresser, somebody said it before that I think to you know uh, this is why when I was sick, really sick, I, if I had a bar of chocolate. I felt nothing much, but if I had some vegetables, I used to get some joint pain. Uh, well, more joint pain, let's say, because there was always joint pain in those days. And I used to wonder why that was. And now I've seen certain things with the plant toxins and, you know, the, the, all, all the uh, toxins bound up in that cellulose, taking it further down into the gut, maybe activating Klebsiella, you know, which has a, 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 quite a strong correlation with, with all, these, all these arthropathies. And then it starts to make sense what your own body was telling you. You see, people get this scientism thing, where are the studies, where are the studies? For me, I think I can see which studies are crap and which aren't just from what's happened to my own body. I enjoy the studies that back up what happened to my own body, like that wonderful study from the World, you know, World Journal of Gastroenterology put it up on, on PubMed or whatever. And... Um, it was 64 people who were really constipated and they took the, all the fiber out of their diet and they, they probably thought that they were all going to explode and they all got better. I mean, all of them, not like some of them a bit. But, and, and the conclusion was we're going to have to seriously reassess the role of fiber in our diet. And so many people are walking around with these awful uh, digestive conditions, you know, ulcerative, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, even just IBS. But they're walking around with this and, and they think I need more and more fiber. And it's like suicide, really, if you're in that state. And it's a very difficult leap to make to think that you can actually have no fiber when meat sits in your colon and rots, you know, rotting flesh in your colon sticks there. And I've never had such good digestion. And I used to be terrible. You know, I used to be blasting the toilet to pieces six, seven times a day minimum when I was on the, all these carbs and grains. And now it's just heaven. I never think about it, you know. I, I, I sometimes, I sometimes feel like waking the missus up and, uh, and saying, "Look at this one, isn't that perfect?" You know, <laughs> look at that. Uh, <laughs> and it's, 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 it's just a joy to have an ass that works again. And I have no fibre. I mean, absolutely zero. So it's, it's obviously nonsense. It really is. And I see it over and over again, don't you, in the groups? Okay, they have some problems in the first month or perceived problems, thinking that they're constipated when they're probably not, actually. And um, even if they are, it tends to pass. But, uh, but you know, now, I just my digestion's amazing. I couldn't imagine going back to something that would be like swallowing a Brillo pad with dynamite in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, interesting, the interesting thing to me with the whole, like, like time of digestion conversation has been, like, it's somewhere, somewhere along the line we determined that 
you know, speedy digestion was optimal versus like a long, slow digestion. And um, I'm, I'm not sure where they're getting that information from. I mean, maybe there's something out there that they're pointing to. But for me, my thought is like, well, if it's going through slowly, perhaps your body is just trying to withdraw as much as it can from it. Whereas if it's passing through fast, it's your body saying, we don't want this in here. Let's get rid of it as quick as possible, which is why it comes out in basically the same chewed state it went in. And, you know, like if you're having those, those personal situations, I think that's probably when it's a good time to start examining, like, you know, what is actually going to be good for you versus not. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I see it so much, so, so much <clears throat> on the group, you know, so many people have been ex vegans. This is the thing when, when people say, what proof is there? People laugh at it, don't they? And they, they're, they're always having a go at Sean when, when, when they says, oh, here's a doctor who, who takes notice of Facebook groups. Well, my, I mean, for goodness sake, there's like 30,000 people on there and, and you're getting such an amazing cross-section of things. And are all these people liars? Are they all shills for the meat industry, as they like to accuse me on YouTube? And I keep saying, you know, why hook me up? I don't know who's going to pay me. I'd love it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to put that info out, even if I'm paid for it. You know, that's great. But it's, it's, it's really happening out there. And, and it's the new, um, you know, there's, a, there's an expression that the next Buddha is the Sangha. You know, the second coming of the Buddha is going to be the crowd. It's going to be the, the, uh, it's, it's going to be the people as a, as a whole. And this is what's happening, and, and hopefully it, it's, it, this will be obvious to see for some people. I, can, I, I always put, point people to the Facebook groups. I say, listen, go and join vegan groups. I join them. I don't troll them like they troll ours. You just watch, you know, and you just chill out and have a bit of a laugh and this and that. Sometimes my heart goes out to them so much because there's some really ill people on there. There's some people, I see people with horrendous arthritis on the vegan groups, and they're saying, oh, well, I have this, um, I have this, uh, this med that I'm taking and, and all the, but I'm on a vegan diet. So that helps. And I think, man, if you weren't on a vegan diet, you wouldn't need that med. And, and, and my heart goes up. You can't say anything. You know, it's like, it's like throwing yourself into a pack of wolves. The, the savagery is amazing, but weirdly, weirdly, the savagery is almost the same on, on, on arthritis forums. They're so caught up in the fact that some doctor has told them that they won't heal, that, that, they don't heal. And I, you know, I can put my book up on there. For, I even put it up for free. I got away with it for a while. And I gave away when I brought it out uh, last year or the year before. And I put it up for free. And I, I, I gave away like, I think, 4,000 odd copies in a couple of days. I just thought I really want this out there and for some people to see that, that you know, I've written about all my battles with the docs, the brief episode with medication, whatever. But, you know, they, and then you get through these groups like you're a heretic. It's incredible uh, for saying, hey, I've got some ideas here. I've actually fixed mine. No, you haven't. You're lying just to sell a product. They say, hey, I'm not selling a product. I'm not selling anything. And this, I think, is a great shame. Now, I always imagine, I have a fantasy of, you know, imagine the guy with cancer going into the doctor and he gets the news and the doc says, you've got six months to live. And quite often they're dead in two weeks, three weeks or something from the fear or, or you know, a few months later from the chemo whereas they probably had it ticking over for eight years or something and they didn't know. But imagine if you went into a doc and he said, okay, you've messed up, but here's some lifestyle things you can do and here's a diet that we've seen can reduce deuterium or whatever it is by that, that process. And we've seen a lot of great results. Said, you, you know, you may very well be able to reverse this round. I, I, I say may very well with cancer because I'm, I'm no expert on that. With autoimmunity, I'd say, yes, you can. You know, instead of saying you're, you're incurable, imagine a doctor saying, do you know what? I'm excited for you because not only are you going to get rid of this, but you're going to learn so much in the process. It's why I called my book arthritis is the best thing that ever happened to me because it's hell at the time. But when you've gone through it and the stuff that you learn and, and I, I think illness can be a real blessing. So to imagine somebody walking out there going, hey, there's hope and people have come through it and, and been better than they were before. Never mind just reversed it. They become more confident. They become better people. They become, you know, less critical of things and, uh, and less dogmatic. Or better husbands, better better wives. Everything. And and for the for a doctor to say that, and for so I've said it, to people, when they've come on to me and there's something I know that you can reverse, like diabetes or arthritis. I know that even if they don't get reverse it, they can get 95% better. And you see their eyes light up. Suddenly they've got some hope instead of a doctor saying you're doomed. 
because that's what they said to me. And I have to say, this rheumatologist was really sweet, and he had a big heart, and he really cared. But he said to me, you're going to be sick, this is not curable, and you're going to have to have pills for the rest of your life. And you walk out of there devastated. Mm. Phil, let me, uh, I mean, have you been back to that rheumatologist and said, hey, look, bud, <laughs> my psoriatic arthritis is gone, because uh, I think that might help open his eyes a little bit. I know I've seen some patients that... Uh, have done that and they you know they get to their doctor and their doctor's kind of scratching his head going huh never seen this before you know how many of them you know actually look into it i don't know but one of the point and you know tim noakes is great about this we had him on a while back and we talked about the wisdom of the crowds that's something that you know he had been saying and i and i definitely got that you know i definitely said it look there's something here and you know you can look at western, western eight price travel the world you know the dentist looking at different cultures and different tribes and examining them but i don't you know, the way I look at it, you know, you can examine people today in that same question. And it may be via social media. You can have a collection of 10,000 people who are essentially a tribe. I mean, they're all they're all collected in one place and you can start examining them, asking them questions. And you, you can get valid information. You know, we have this sort of thing about how we define science. Science is merely observation. You know, it's basically making multiple observations and then coming up with rationale for doing that. You know, when we do one of these huge epidemiologic studies where they hand you a, a, a questionnaire and tell you to fill this out, you know, and then collect the data. That's no better, in my view. I mean, it's probably worse in, in some cases because, you know, it's like uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have ask you to remember what you ate, you know, for the last year. How many times how many times a week you ate an apple, you know, for the for the last year? No one can remember that. But we're we're willing, we're perfectly willing to just call that acceptable science because it's been statistically analyzed and you know, been blessed by the, the, the appropriate peer folks. But uh, if you want to just, you know, go ask 5,000 people, did this diet work or not? And, you know, most of them say, yes, that's now considered not science at all, which I think is dangerous. I do agree. I think what we're seeing more and more that people are getting this. We're using social media as a tool to advance knowledge. It's going to probably, it's probably going to lead to more knowledge advances than, than anything else, in my view, because you have such power of scale. I mean, you can, you know, the cream rises to the top, the results matter. You know, like I said, if the diet doesn't work, people are going to abandon it. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, you know, with carnivory, there's no ethical, um, you know, there's no religious affiliation. There's no ethics attached to this stuff. It's, you know, if it doesn't work for you, why the hell are you doing it? That would be my counsel, you know. Why are you doing anything if it doesn't work? You know, if it clearly, clearly doesn't work, you know, give it a little bit of time, but then if it stops working, do something else. I mean, sure. Um, but yeah, did you talk to your, did you go back to your rheumatologist and say, Hey, look, man, what's going on? Well, I had two rheumatologists. I, the first one was a real sweet one. He didn't seem to know anything, you know, about exactly how to fix it. So I did go back to him in the early stages and I said, this is, uh, this is really clearing up, you know, and I'm doing it with diet. And I explained to him and he said, yeah, you know, at some, at some point come back and, and, and tell me, you know, what's going on. But then I, I changed rheumatologists. And when I really did get a lot better, I did go back to him. You know, I wasn't planning on it. In fact, you know, early on in, in my healing, I had this horrendous sort of violence in my head towards rheumatologists. And now I don't. I realize, you know, everybody's just doing their best. But I was like, all my frustrations were, were, were aimed towards the rheumatologists. And, and they were so, uh, this, this guy seemed really sweet to start with. But then, uh, then he kind of turned a bit. And then this appointment came up, so I did go back to him and I said, listen, I'm doing really well, check this out. I said, look, I'm looking in your waiting room and everybody's really overweight and everybody's sick. And you know, this is, but I mean, it's actually a hospital of rheumatology right near me. Uh, and and the, the first thing you smell when you go in is cakes and toast, you know, in the shop. And, that, and that's what they've got. And they've got all these vending machines and all these people were sitting around eating eating biscuits and whatever waiting to go in and some of them on crutches and and I sort of danced in I said hey look at this look 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 what I've done and he said you've got to take some methotrexate it's going to get into your heart and it's going to get into your lungs and you're risking um um malignancies I'm like man look I mean is something that's reversing it like this really do you think that's going to be increasing my chance no you need to be on methotrexate and and I was like do you think I had this arthritis from a deficiency of methotrexate? You know, it, 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 it just, it isn't that. And he got so angry. He got so angry with me. Seriously, he wouldn't look at me, wouldn't do anything. He started frothing at the corners of his mouth. I, I'm, I'm not joking. He was shouting at me that much. 
And I said to him, I said, I said, you know that frothing like that can be a sign of, of, of some heart problems. <laughs> and, and I just legged it out. I just legged it. I, I, and I didn't go back. He was so angry. And I thought, I don't understand the mentality of a lack of curiosity. I, I just I just don't see that, really. I don't. And, and, and when it's always with the studies, like uh, Malcolm Kendrick said, didn't he, that somebody put in one of these uh, studies, these peer-reviewed studies, they buried in the text, phone this number, uh, you know, and, and, and get a case of champagne, and nobody phoned up. Because people probably don't even read them. And so all, all the people screaming out for peer-reviewed studies, they probably just tick them off because they're their mates, you know. I'm sure not always. But nothing is reliable. We're all humans. Nobody's nobody's perfect and bringing out these perfect studies. You've, you you are alone with your intuition. It's scary at first, but after a while, it's incredibly uh, empowering that you don't need the doc all the time. You can generally figure out what's the matter with you, you know, unless you you got a bone sticking out because you've come off your motorcycle, and then you know you you don't stay at home and have a little rub down and a cup of tea. You you you, you go <laughs> to the hospital. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, uh, you know, and, and it, it's a sad story that the doctor is so unwilling to. Uh, I love that methotrexate deficiency causes for psoriatic <laughs> arthritis. I mean, that that you know, and I, I literally think there's, you know, that's the same thing with. Uh, I saw that when I was in my medical training, people talking about we need Lipitor, you know, a statin in the water. We need it in a drinking supply. Uh, humans, mm. humans are suffering from a deficiency of some drug, which is just absolute insanity. But I, you know, hopefully more people that you know, that did, did do end up reversing these conditions, whether it's arthritis or depression or some other, some other thing will go to their doctor and say, hey, look, I'm better and this is what I did. And if enough people do that, you know, maybe one out of 10 of those doctors will actually catch a clue and snap and then we can slowly kind of turn this thing around because it's just, just, just kind of this horrible miasma of, you know, hopelessness. I mean, it's, it's, it's so crazy out there but uh phil i mean i think that's that's good stuff um just well let's talk about you know let's talk about light because i know you're being the you're you're like the i don't want to call you, i mean if jack cruz wants to make you an archangel an archangel of light one of his <laughs> disciples because I, I i don't you know I, I'm, I'm aware of the, the the effects if i haven't studied it extensively you know i try to minimize the stuff you know get off the phone after a certain period of time i don't walk around with blue blocker glasses or you know stuff like that i just think there's 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 a point of practicality and there's a point of you know what's going to make how much of a difference but what can you tell us about that briefly and then we'll we'll probably let you go because we gotta we gotta uh we gotta keep people from uh well i don't know we can talk longer i guess zach i don't care whatever <laughs> up to you man i'm okay whatever works uh, yeah <laughs> yeah well you know the, i remember where back when i was real sick there was one day where i decided that um i was going to try jack's cold thermogenesis protocol and I was going to try the blue blockers and I did them on the same day I hadn't been sleeping when you're that sick you're sort of waking up at every every half an hour and you're not getting any sleep you know I wasn't even getting up the stairs it was too painful to get up I'd fall asleep on the couch and I'd be kind of peeing in jam jars because you know just just because I didn't want to go to the toilet it, it was in a real mess and one day I thought, OK, I'm going to try this. And I didn't do all the face dunking and all the nice little cold showers and whatever. I just got in a freezing bath and I, 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 I just went straight for it. At that point, you're just so desperate. And I got out of that bath and the inflammation was down probably 70, 80 percent just after a five, 10 minute cold bath. And I thought, hold on, we're onto something here. And then I put the blue blocking shades on. And, but I was so skinny at the time and I had no insulation on me and I was just shivering all evening. And I thought, I'm never going to sleep. I remember being able to get up the stairs, but I went to sleep in my son's bedroom. He was away at uni at the time. Uh, I thought, I'm just going to lie there shivering. I'm going to keep the missus awake. So I went in and I lay in, the, in, in my son's bed. And I, I thought, I can't get to sleep at all. You know, Next thing I knew, I woke up 11 hours later. And I hadn't even moved position. And it was the best night's sleep I'd ever had in my life. And at that point, I thought, Jack's really onto something here. Again, it's if you're really sick, you notice these things more. So I started to wear the shades and I started to get much better sleep at night. You know, it's to do with the whole cortisol melatonin cycle. Um, if you don't, if you, if you got too much light at night and it's going through that super chiasmatic nucleus in the, in the hypothalamus and dysregulating all the body clocks and telling you it's morning when it's night, then, then um, you're not going to get such good sleep. One thing I noticed recently 
that was really interesting. We've we've got Iris on the computers. Iris Tech is very good. It, it, it gets rid of the blue light, has many different settings for different times of day and whatever you're doing. I do proofreading as well of magazines, people's books. I put it on a biohacker setting so that the print is orange and what would be the white paper in Word is black. And it's so relaxing. You know, you can look at that for hours without getting a headache. Um, it, it deals with flicker as well. You get things like that going. But the problem was always the television and the kids. You can't get them to wear orange glasses. I don't force anything on the kids. You know, I'll tell them this and that, but I don't force anything on them. Uh, but we noticed that the kids, we, we were sort of falling off and being to sleep and getting drowsy like nine o'clock at night. And the kids were still up and raging. They wouldn't go to bed. So we got a screen and we put it on the front of the television, this orange screen. Kind of looks weird to start with, but you get used to it. You know, everybody being the same color. And it, it suddenly it's a bedtime and the kids were going straight up to bed and they were falling asleep. And this, there was no other artificial light. It was just a television when they turned that on. And the candles around the place that we use at night, so much nicer. We don't use artificial light. Uh, we, we, we don't have Wi-Fi. We, we have that plugged in. Now, I'm not sure about that. I have friends who are very electrosensitive. And I've got one friend, a, a, a girl who can definitely tell if you switch your mobile on in the back of the car, you know, and she's driving and she can tell if someone switched the mobile phone on. Um, she, she's very sensitive to all of this. I'm not. I don't know how much of that. Uh, affects me that might affect other people more but the light was big very very big for sleep and yeah it's made it has made a huge difference I think it's very simple you just you see the dawn when you're supposed to see the dawn and you see the sunset when you're supposed to see the sunset I I, I spend a night a week out fishing I used to spend three out before I had my second load of kids and I love it I just go night fishing that's where I make all my YouTube videos when I'm sitting at a lake you know I love it to go out there and you see the dawn, you see the dusk. I sleep, you know, I sleep beautifully. I have a camp bed and I have a bivy, you know. It's, it's, not, it's not uncomfortable. I'm not sitting there holding the, a fishing rod all night. But it, it, the, the beautiful sleep that you get when you're out in nature, you've got your feet on the ground, you're seeing the, the natural light. And I, I believe that has a lot to do with it. I, I, I think the times when I was real sick before, well, leading up to be really sick, but I was still going fishing, I'd go out for the night and I, I, I'd eat a load of rubbish, as I always did. And... Uh, but I'd feel a hell of a lot better. And then when I came back into the house, I'd feel my back starting to get painful again. And now I believe it was probably down to the quality of sleep from the light or just the light itself, you know, just being outside and maybe the whole deuterium depletion thing, which goes hand in hand with that. I don't know. You know, I, I just know that a lot of these things that are coming out in science now are just very simple and point back to our an ancestral heritage. What are the things that these tribes that don't have these chronic diseases do? And what did we not do that we do now when, when we didn't have these chronic diseases, even in this society? And it comes down to, you know, light, temperature, um, foods that are out of season, you know, all, all these things. It's pretty, pretty easy. You can pretty much explain all of this to somebody in five minutes. What, what's taken me 40 years of studying diet and lifestyle to learn. It, it, it's so simple, really. But without the science to back it up, because everybody's into science and, you know, it appears on the front of a tabloid newspaper and, and, and then they, they get afflicted with scientism and it says scientists say and then they believe it. So the thing is, just switch your lights off and see what happens. It's, it's, it's great. We have these little, um, little lights, little single red LEDs that when you walk into the toilet at night, they come on. You don't have to turn the light on. Because I find even checking the phone at night, it puts a blast of blue light in and then, then it disrupts your sleep. And, you know, it's, it's fascinating to see this and also to see sleep in, in one hour and a half cycles instead of like eight hours. So I might sleep three cycles, and then I'll get up, then I'll watch a film. The, the house is quiet. I have my shades on. The screen's on the telly, you know, and I can watch a film. And then when my eyelids start to droop again, I'll go back to bed and sleep another couple of cycles of, of one and a half hours. Or it's one hour 20 for me. It varies for different people. And, and when you start to understand things like that and sleep, you know, and how a lot of these indigenous tribes used to used to sleep biphasically and they'd get up in the middle of the night, tell stories, make love. You know, they do all of this kind of thing and then they go back to bed again. And it's perfectly natural. This can happen if you sleep all the way through. Fine. That's cool, too. But don't panic if you don't. But if you've got the light sorted out, you've get, you're getting a really good quality of sleep. And it was at that point when I started to do that. For me, that was when a, a big, another step in my healing kicked in. When I was sleeping properly, when I was doing cold thermogenesis, 
and when I had the light right. I, it, it, was, it, it blew me away. And I probably wouldn't have noticed it if I'd been really healthy and robust. You know, I've been a musician. I've been up all night under artificial light and I'm doing really late gigs. And then you get back and you eat at two o'clock in the morning. And that was the lifestyle I was leading. I didn't really notice it. But my God, I'd notice it now. And, and a good thing of being a uh, carnivore is that at the end of the gig, late at night, when everybody else is shouting for a pizza, you're thinking, well, what's the problem? You know, have they had no nutrition today? You, you don't have to eat late at night. You can wait till the next day. It's, you don't get a savage hunger. So, you know, I, I think it all goes hand in hand. And, and you only notice the effects of these kind of things when, when, when you're really sick. So, yeah, I was very fortunate at the time when I was... Um, really sick that I had I had enough money to sit around and do all this and do all these experiments but my real passion is to kind of bring this to people now and and I, I sort of still feel a bit guilty of skyping people because we still always have a little bit of uh, 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 that that brainwashing oh I'm not a doctor you know I did, I did some blog post you're not a doctor who the fuck do you think you are because this is this is such a common uh, this is such a common uh, uh, objection on the YouTube channel or whatever but I think I've, I've had so much experience of all these protocols. And I mean, there's, there's thousands of things I tried that I never mentioned because they were so insane. You know, urine therapy. <laughs> I've, I've, tried, I've tried drinking distilled water for months and I stripped my body of zinc and, 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 and I, had to, I, I lost my sense of taste completely. You know, I've had my real disasters with these, this weird biohacking world. And I, I think I've been through a lot of the things and found out a lot of the things that don't work and that some of them are downright harmful. Probably, to be honest, not as harmful as methotrexate, but still harmful, you know. And, and so to lead people to, uh, around those things who don't want to make a, a life of blabbing about this sort of thing like I do, and they just want to get back to their regular life, I, it's, it's such a, a real pleasure to be able to lead them through this. And I would say light is a real big one. I think, I think light is probably the biggest of all of them uh, alongside diet. So, yeah, there you go. It's pretty simple, really. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of crazy how we now you know even just just we're taking it one step further with the fact that we 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 fear the sun now we don't want to get outside you know we if we do we we wear you know three layers of clothes sunglasses hats and you know sun protection factor fifty to get outside and you know it's it's like well, we we evolved under a sun you know and it's just uh, I don't know it just seems kind of kind of crazy how we've how we've kind of figured out we're going to outsmart nature and we're not you know we're not who we were for the, for the last three million years uh sun exposure is another thing when when i was sick and even before for about 10 years i avoided the sun i couldn't stand it i had i used to have to have a fan on my drum kit to pl even play a gig to blow into my face because i had really really bad rosacea and 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 just hot flushes and and boiling hot all the time and if i went out in the sun at all it felt horrendous on my body and, and I'd burn really, really fast and I didn't feel well, so I'd avoid it. So um, now, having gone onto this kind of diet, what I'm seeing a lot is, as well, my sun tolerance has gone up massively. The whole rosacea thing, I mean, I had loads of things, fatty liver, cysts on the liver, kidney stones, I had from juicing spinach, I, I had a ton of things. It wasn't just um, psoriatic arthritis. And they've all pretty much cleared up. You know, there's certain things, I, 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 the, the little scars of things I'm left with, like my left knee might never go quite go back to how it was. Uh, all, all the other joints have. Um, there's, there's all sorts of little things that have happened. And, and now if I go out and sun, I have this ridiculous English skin where I'll kind of go bright red from the neck up and but start to tan now from the neck down. But I don't burn. There's no pain. There's nothing like that, you know. And it's, it's, a, it's a one, it, there's scars that we have from from our past abuse but my god they get they get mitigated so much by this carnivorous diet like the the times that i've seen i saw a great story one guy who who's sort of red haired and pale skinned and he couldn't go out in the sun uh, um and i i sympathize with him because i have a my missus is from tanzania and she's jet black and she can stay out in the sun all day and if we go on holiday you know i get to see her for about 15 minutes a day <laughs> it's, it's difficult i'm inside having a steak or something so um, you just got to go inside, just got to, you know, go with your skin tolerance. But this guy, he, he had a Brazilian wife who could outlast him in the sun. And now he's outlasting her and, and it, it, for sun tolerance. Now he's on a carnivorous diet. And I think that's amazing. I, I don't know what the process is there, really, that, that's causing that. But I'm seeing that story over and over again. Another useless anecdote for us. <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, we actually talked to Tucker Goodrich about that a little bit on one of our earlier episodes, and uh, it was really interesting to me personally as well because when I was younger, um, like teenage, early twenties, you know, it was, I, you know, it was always kind of a joke. Like, as I lived in the Midwest at the time, so you're coming out of winter, pale as ever. And, uh, you know, the first two, three times out in the sun, like you just go out there and and get just fried and just peel. And it was like you just kind of get through those two, three burnings more or less. And then you were kind of set for the rest of the summer. And, you know, since kind of going going low carb and, you know, avoiding like those seed oils and things like that, um, almost like the plague, it it's it's fascinating to me. Like, you know, I live out west now, so I get sun exposure year round and um you know, even when it does get a little cloudier and I lose a little bit of the, of the tan, like I'll go out for four or five hours for long runs with no shirt sometimes and I don't burn. Like it's like at worst I might get a tiny little peeling on my nose, but not like what it would have been in the past where you can like literally peel chunks of skin off your back and stuff like that. So, um, it's, it really is an interesting thing when you, when you start tying in like, you know, well, what's causing it? Is it the sun that's causing it or is it something else that you're doing that's allowing the sun to do the or like assist in the damage i guess um but yeah it's it's interesting to see other people kind of report that stuff back too yeah yeah i thought it was also real fascinating with chaba going on about the 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 carbs blocking the uptake of vitamin d you know that that was interesting that people sort of struggling to get their vitamin d up and popping all these pills going out in the sun with sunscreen on and, and it's just not working because they're eating eating uh you know, cocoa pops and pizza all day, and and it's it's yeah, it's a fascinating, whole fascinating business. I tell you, Zach, I wanted to ask you something actually. Yeah. If I may. When I wrote, uh, I wrote some book in about '96, and I was really influenced. I used to be doing a lot of mountain biking back then, and I I got really kind of influenced by John Duyard's book, Body Mind Sport. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. Mm-hmm. And he's on about this whole kind of yogic thing of of setting the breathing and setting the heart rate with the breathing, you know, with a, a resting phase and then a listening phase and then a performance phase. And I was finding with a heart rate monitor that, um, <clears throat> that I was bringing down the, um, uh, my heart rate by setting up this sort of slow breathing and bringing down the heart rate for any e- e- equivalent sort of uh, activity. Like I'd go up a particular hill that I knew in the same time and notice that at the top my heart rate was sort of... Uh, 20 beats per minute lower than if I didn't do this particular warm-up thing. And I wondered if there's anything, I was, I've been thinking about that when I've been listening to these podcasts and listening to all your training stuff. I wondered if you've ever used anything like that, uh, the sort of setting the breathing thing to lower the heart rate and whatever. And is that anything you've ever come across? Yeah, yeah there's, there's definitely some stuff out there with that, like the breathing, the heart rate stuff. I've used like heart rate stuff a lot more than I have with, with breathing. My like you know, without knowing a whole bunch about it, my first thought is that kind of like some people probably kind of naturally like optimize just from practice. Like, you know, your body's going to try to get efficient if you keep doing things over and over again. So if you're out running a ton and doing hills and things like that, you know, chances are your your breathing is going to kind of match whatever's going to be the most efficient uh, through practice. Um, but that doesn't say like people just getting started or people starting to train like in a different environment or different weather or something like that couldn't probably benefit from focusing on that more. Um, but really at the end of the day, what I, when I look at heart rate and stuff is if, uh, if my heart rate at a, if, if at a given heart rate, if my pace is improving throughout like a training cycle, that's kind of the metric I look at the most because then I'm getting more efficient, uh, essentially by going faster at the same heart rate. And that's kind of the one I pay the most attention to. Um, but, you know, one of the things I find interesting, too, is like, and I get further away from this type of stuff now that I'm running kind of more ultra marathons is you get these faster kind of interval sessions. And and those ones tend to kind of really, I think, uh, show you where your weaknesses are. And because you're just you're just kind of going a little closer to like of a maximal effort and those are the ones where I find like kind of paying attention to breathing can help a little more because then you're, you're kind of getting in a rhythm and making sure you're not getting yourself in this position where you almost hold your breath just because it's such a fast or such a quick interval session. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question at all, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was just, I was just wondering if, you know, in, in that unbelievable world of ultra marathoning, whether mm-hmm. you, you kind of aware of that breathing thing. And yeah. That's, and I, it, you do. 
there, there's a, there's like some breathing technique things too that go along kind of with a like a maximum aerobic function or like math training principle too where i think they're looking at like x amount of breaths in per stride and you know my thought is always like if you're out there not doing that and you're you're clipping and wrong at a, at a at a pace and then you switch and pay attention to the breathing also and your heart rate comes down say five beats per minute then it's probably worth paying attention to and um if you kind of get that into a routine, it probably becomes natural at a certain point. You don't necessarily have to think about like, you know, making sure you get this amount of breaths per stride or something like that either. Yeah. Oh, cool. So, yeah. Anything well, else you, on the yeah what else you got for us, Phil? Anything else? Any other final stuff? Uh, Zach well, and I are going to do a Q&A. And so I... <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. You, you're going to have endurance, you know, you well, imagine. I should, I should say, actually, my endurance is quite good. I don't have to have a refeed like some of these other folks do. But uh, <laughs> uh, we want to respect your times too, as well, Phil. So, what else? What else? Where can we find you, Phil? What else? Any other final words of uh, parting wisdom from someone who's been around for a while? Oh man, I don't know. I think we've covered a load of stuff there. It's um, it's uh, yeah, we got into some good things. There's all the beyond stuff, all the woo woo, the light, the everything, you know. And uh, yeah, that's cool. I mean, I, I, I can be found at, um, my website's called pureactivity.net. I believe just philescott.com um, points at that now. And, and you can find, you know, books and consults and whatever, if anybody wants to chat to me. I'm really happy to, to, to take people through some of this weirdness and some advice as well on the carnivory, if they're their autoimmunity or whatever. I've got I've got Twitter. I don't know what that is, but I, I think Phil <laughs> something. I, I, that's that that's that's a funny one. You're you're into Instagram. I haven't figured that out yet. I'll, I suppose I better get into that at some point. But it's, it just takes so much keeping up with the Facebook groups and stuff. Yeah, we've got um, 100% Carnivore and Beyond. Uh, that's nice and irreverent and funny. It's quite quite amusing to join. We go on about some lunatic stuff and uh, delicate snowflakes. Probably better not <laughs> venture in there. <laughs> Um, what I'm really excited about, though, what, what I'm really excited about at the moment is I'm just in the middle of, well, I'm almost at the end of doing the videos. I think I'm five little videos from the end of it. I'm putting together a course, taking people all the way from this. I want to take people from diagnosis to, 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 to getting better. I want to, I want to take people from, through all these aspects with uh, aspects of confidence and, uh, um, you know, to, to give them um, action plans to to look into all these things, take them to all the right people to take away their doubts about these kind of things and meat and fat and all the stuff that's built up around that, to take them through all the light and deuterium and cold thermogenesis, emotional balancing, absolutely everything, and then give them these kind of work plans underneath. So putting together a course for Teachable at the moment, and that'll be out soon. So 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 come and get on the mailing list if you're interested in that, and I'll um, you'll, you'll, you'll get some news of that. But I'm really quite excited about this. I started it off and I thought, can I do this? And I thought, yeah, I'll do some kind of eight videos. And I, I think I'm on about 20 at the moment. I can't, I can't seem to run out of things that I think of. I think, oh, and I'll cover that, and I'll cover that, and I'll cover that. So I'm quite excited to see how, how this is going to go to be able to take people through that and give them access to something like that. You know, all the wisdom of the other people I've come across as well who, who, have, who have been tremendous mentors and take them all through that. So that's what I'm kind of excited about. So that's, you know, that's where you can find me. You know, Phil, I'll just, I'll just comment on that because I think this is an interesting general philosophical discussion because we have a, you know, we have a sick populace and we have a mechanism by which we're supposed to get better. You know, that's to go see your doctor, go into the healthcare system, and, and, and that's highly regulated and it's, you know, it's regulate who can do that and who can dispense medical advice and so on and so forth. And, you know, for many people, that doesn't work very well. And so when you have these people that do these alternative type things, a lot of people consider those people substandard, unregulated, dangerous. Um, I think ultimately the market will dictate, you know, what your results are, what your results are going to be. And so if you want to hang a shingle, a shingle out there and say, I'm Phil Escott and I can help you cure your, your psoriatic arthritis. No, I'm not a doctor, but this is what worked for me. And you want to do that. I think more power to you. And I hopefully we don't see a, a crackdown on that where people aren't allowed to do this. You know, I think it's, oh, you know, you. Not. I, think, I think to me, for me, it's a, you know, I'm going to call it the subtraction method because it's not about adding things and pills and powders and potions. I'm not going up against the doctors. You know, it's just pointing out lifestyle ideas that might allow the body to heal itself. 
You know, the body has all these systems in place. It has done for, since the dawn of time. Uh, you know, there's guys like you, if you smash your knee or hip up, where the body really doesn't have uh, the healing systems, and you guys can, can sort that out. But on the subtler things, on the areas of medicine where they're just pumping the chemicals in, the results are appalling. And I, I'm not doing anything like saying, you know, drink, drink a load of this or that. or You know, all I'm saying is to, the things to take out of your routine, really. So I, I don't see that... Um, I, I don't see that there's there's a problem with people going out and doing that. And I, I'm seeing a lot of the wisdom I'm seeing is from from the people who who are lay people, but also from doctors who studied outside their own field. Yeah, I find that surgeons and um, neurosurgeons, surgeons, um, ER doctors, these seems to be seem to be the guys who are the most open. And as I've met them in hospitals as well, you know, when I had visits with my mom and other people or whatever who I've taken in. These are the guys who are the most open and the most fun to talk to. And the other ones who are on the prescriptive side are kind of shutting down to it. And, and, and uh, you know, this, this uh, you're right, it's going to come out. And, I, you know, we can work hand in hand with doctors. I, I, I'm in awe of the skills of, you know, we have a very close family friend who is a, a neurosurgeon in, in Jordan. And I'm absolutely in awe of what he can do. He's, he's unbelievable. So this, this side of, of medicine is, is, is marvelous, we, but we could shut down all the rest. What we need in hospitals is a human body department, don't we? We don't need like a kidney department and a left little finger <laughs> department. You've broken your right little finger and you have to get referred by your GP back to go. It's crazy. It's crazy. Put it all together. Understand how it all works together. And that's, that's all I'm trying to do. See how nature works together and tell people how to subscri- subtract stuff. You know, that's all. That's all. Well, good luck to you, Phil. I mean, I know when I do, I do a little bit of consult, consulting myself in a, in a non-medical capacity because I don't want to practice medicine, you know, uh, you know, officially. And so, it is extremely rewarding when you get people calling you up, and you know, you, you know, half the time it's some telling me how much their life has already radically improved, and they just want to fine tune some things. And so, it's extremely rewarding. It's 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 it makes getting up in the morning worthwhile doing. You know, I'm sure Zach when he helps when he coaches his folks. I mean, it's it's just a really you know, maybe not the most financially lucrative thing in the world to do, but it's certainly, uh, you know, it makes you feel good about your place on, on the planet, I think, sometimes. Oh, man, the messages I get, they blow me away sometimes, you know, and it's it's not what I've done. I haven't done anything. I've, ju- I've just told them how to do it themselves, and it's beautiful. So some of the messages I get, you know, even from people who've been, well, I'm sure you get them too, hundreds of them, the people who have just seen this stuff, you know, and it, it, you, you haven't even talked to them maybe. Or some people I run into on the street and I haven't seen them for a while and they're like 50 pounds lighter. And they say, oh, I've been watching your stuff on Facebook. And you go, whoa, well done. You know, you hardly recognize them. And, and it's, it, yeah, it is really, really re- rewarding. Some of the messages I've got, I've, got I've, I've had a lump in my throat. You know, people have had their lives back. And it's beautiful. It's just old ancestral wisdom. It's nothing that Phil S. got made up. Uh, you know, I can't take credit for any of it. I just uh, weeded it out from all the the brightest people out there, you know, and from my own body. <laughs> well, I think we're all, we're all learning and we're all, uh, you know, I mean, we're slowly, I think, I think we're doing, doing the right thing. Well, I think, Phil, it's been a pleasure. Um, hopefully, uh, maybe we'll get you back on down the road. Maybe you can put me in contact with Jack Cruz and maybe we can get him on here and uh, see if he's interested and further dig into this uh, deuterium and light and cold therapy and some of the other stuff. And, you know, incidentally, I, I, I'm certainly not, uh, in, in disagreement with any of that stuff. I just don't know. I'm just not an expert in it. And so I, and I've, I've, I've employed cold therapy. I've done my share of ice baths and I certainly try to avoid, you know, the light after, after night type stuff. So I think there's certainly something there. So it's interesting to continue to talk to Zach. Get, any, get, I mean, get, get Laszlo Boros on too. He's, <laughs> he's amazing. So he's a good fun guy. He's funny as well. Uh, he's really good. That talk, that Vermont talk 2018 on deuterium. If anybody's interested, watch that. It's, it's spectacular. He's a funny guy. I, I just hooked up with him as well and just was chatting to him a little bit. And he's joined. He's joined my group. Well, if, and, you put him, yeah. if you can put him into contact with Zach and I, we'll we'll, we'll certainly. I, I think it's interesting. It's just we try to keep these, uh, you know, because we talk about meat plenty, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's nice to reinforce that message, but it's also nice to continue to to expand our horizons a little bit. Yeah, cool. you know, it's interesting stuff. I think uh, you know that's definitely worth exploring. And like Sean, I don't, I'm not nearly as uh in tune with the the research and stuff from it but you know i think it's it's one of those things where it's it's kind of like nutrition in that like you can you can glean a lot of information just from like 
looking at what happens like if you stay up and watch TV or watch Netflix versus you know turning the lights off and laying down like how much quicker do you do your body turn down and you know that's probably step one for most people absolutely yeah 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 Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you again, Phil, for coming on. It was great to have you. And uh, we'll share some of the links to your stuff on the show notes, too, so listeners can find you. Um, but otherwise, have a, have a great rest of the day. And you guys. And thank you so much for getting me on. It was, a, it was an honor, and it was, it was fun. Great, great to meet Phil. you. We'll, we'll put it out. You know, it typically goes on Patreon first, and about two weeks later, we'll throw it up for general consumption. So we'll certainly let you know. And, you know, as you know, I've been spamming your Facebook group with all our HBO podcasts. <laughs> You're always welcome. I think they're brilliant. I've listened to them all. You know, I go out night fishing. I've always got one in my headphones. So you guys are always there while I'm failing to catch fish. So it's nice <laughs> to finally meet you. Well, hopefully, hopefully it'll help you catch fish next time. We'll get better. Maybe maybe, maybe seeing some fish 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 biorhythms or something. I don't know. We need a carnivore pro angler to bring on the show. That'll up both sides of the game, I suppose. <laughs> Alrighty. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.